what is the best flight control firmware you can use? Everybody knows the answer to that, right? Obviously, it's it's Betaflight. <laughs> Don't give give me a break. It's clearly Clean Flight, Emu Flight, F Flight One, Flight One, Falco X, uh, I Inav, Kiss, Kiss. There's no one right answer to that question, is there? But what I did is I asked a bunch of you what your favorite flight control software was and why. And today we're going to dive into the reasons, not what's the best, because there isn't a best for everyone. Otherwise, we wouldn't have all these firmwares. But what draws someone to one of these firmwares over the other? I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Any video comparing flight control or firmware kind of has to start with Betaflight. Betaflight is by far the most popular of any firmware for racing freestyle for that kind of quad. And in some sense, that's its strength, but also its weakness. Let's dive in. You can run Betaflight on a huge variety of hardware from really top premium high quality stuff all the way down to ultra bargain basement cheap, probably going to die a minute you plug it in stuff. That means that whatever your price point, you could probably find Betaflight hardware that will work for you. But it also means that you're not really guaranteed to have a good experience just because you're buying Betaflight hardware. Betaflight's popularity means that there is a huge community of people making documentation and tutorials about Betaflight. Uh, and that means that Whatever your question, probably there's several tutorials out there to help you answer it. This can actually be a downside because there's a whole lot of helpful people giving incorrect answers to Betaflight questions. Whereas when you ask a question about some of the other firmwares, you just don't get any answer at all. Well, which is better. Betaflight's PID controller can be tweaked and tuned in a huge number of ways. And this means that pretty much whatever you want Betaflight to do, you could probably get it to do it. You could probably get the kind of stick feel you want, whether you're a racer, a freestyler, whether you're flying a large quad, whether you're flying a very small micro quad. But very few people seem really excited about the default tune that Betaflight comes with. As we look at other flight control softwares, there's always someone out there saying, oh my God, you have to try this. It feels so good. It flies so good. And you just don't seem to see as much of that with Betaflight, especially considering how freaking popular it is. Maybe that's because it's in some sense the default that people start with and then the people who are happy just assume that's how it's supposed to be and the people who are unhappy go somewhere else and go, oh, this is so much better. But I wonder if the Betaflight devs, knowing how popular their firmware is and how many, especially beginners, are going to be using it, have sort of diluted it a little bit rounded the edges off just to make sure everybody has like an okay experience rather than trying to make some people have a great experience and some people maybe have a bad experience. Here we're looking at Betaflight's PID tuning tab and immediately you can see how some people get a little bit overwhelmed. What is integrated yaw and do I want it on or off? What should I do to tune it? There are so many options here, and there's even more options if you dive into the command line. Beta, the development pace of Betaflight is extremely fast. The devs are always trying to add new stuff to make the quad fly better. And that leads some people to be to feel really overwhelmed, not just with the sheer number of options that are here, the sheer number of knobs and dials that can be tweaked, but just with the pace of development. Betaflight actually only updates about twice a year, and yet every time it comes out, some people feel that so much has changed that they have to just relearn it all over again. Some people find that really exciting. Other people just find it freaking overwhelming, and they just want to fly their freaking quad. Now, Betaflight is an open source project, and that means that anybody can look at the development process in real time. You just go to the GitHub website, and you look at the issues or pull requests or any of that stuff, you can literally watch the developers talk through the changes in the code as it's happening. And this could be really enjoyable for some people who just want to see behind the curtain of how the development is going. How did we get 
these all these new features that you added that are overwhelming us. Why did you add them? Well, you can just go look and you can see what the intent of the devs is. And that can be really educational and interesting if you're into that sort of thing. If you just want to fly quads and you don't care about that, then that's not really a plus for you. Betaflight is a very fast pace of development. Although they only release about twice a year, they are constantly trying new things to get Betaflight to fly better. And they're very focused on data-driven results, not subjective feel. In other words, the devs are always looking at black box data from the quadcopter to try to see objectively what makes the quadcopter more precisely carry out the commands that it's being given by the pilot. And there's not much stay. If somebody says, well, I just think it feels better. I like the, the feel better. They don't seem to pay a lot of attention to that. That's either a plus or a minus, depending on your focus. It really seems to be one of the major dividing factors among people who really like Betaflight and say, show me the data. And other people who say, I can't show you the data, but look, look at the, it just flies better. This other firmware, it's just better. I, I can't prove it. Uh, go watch the movie, uh, what's the Jodie Foster? You know, the aliens and she, anyway. <laughs> The next one we got to look at is Clean Flight. Clean Flight is almost almost didn't make it onto this list because Clean Flight was the sort of ancestor of Betaflight. Betaflight sort of forked off of it, became much more popular, and eclipsed it in user base for sure. Uh, after some time, Clean Flight was kind of keeping up with Betaflight by pulling back. That's how open source projects do it. It was pulling back features. Finally, it got so far behind, it just did a thing called a rebase, where basically Clean Flight 2.0 just became Betaflight, but with a green logo instead of a yellow logo. And at, in that respect, Clean Flight isn't really worth talking about very much. It had some differences from Betaflight, but basically very few people were using it. Recently, the main developer of CleanFlight, Dominic Clifton, has separated his project more definitively from the Betaflight project. It is still based on the Betaflight project. It still pulls from the Betaflight project, but due to some interpersonal devs can have strong opinions about various things and he has broken away. I wanted to make sure I mentioned Clean Flight in this list separately, at least in part because Dominic Clifton has his own line of flight controllers, the SP Racing line of flight controllers. They implement some very, very cool features that nobody else has. In some sense, he is months or years ahead of the rest of the industry in terms of flight controller features, and he's going to be implementing those features first and maybe eventually at some point exclusively in Clean Flight. Next one on the list is KISS. Keep it simple, silly. And KISS was started with the goal of making it easier for people to build and fly a quadcopter. The developer of KISS looked at Clean Flight, or maybe it was Betaflight, but I think it was even far back enough that it, Betaflight didn't exist yet. He looked at it and it's just growing and growing with so many knobs and dials and features and it just was so complicated to set up. And he said, I'm just gonna get rid of most of this. I'm gonna make a firmware that flies well and is easy and simple to set up. And in some sense, KISS lives up to that. KISS is simple to set up. When you look at the KISS configurator, there are fewer options there, less stuff to overwhelm you. The flip side of KISS's simplicity is that in some ways it is less capable than some other firmwares. It has all the basic functions that anybody would want and it flies, well, more about how it flies later, but suffice it to say, there's no complaints there. There are some cutting edge features and capabilities and add-ons that other firmwares have that KISS doesn't have because their goal is not to do everything, it's to do the main things really, really freaking well and easy to set up. Many people argue that KISS has the absolute best stick feel for freestyle. Uh, that's hard to quantify and it's hard to communicate. Suffice it to say, they just feel like the quad is very connected, very in control, like they're able to make it do what they want it to do. And they feel like the default PID tune on KISS flies really well without having to change too many of the defaults to get the quad to fly very, very well. The way that KISS handles hardware is different from the way that Betaflight and CleanFlight handle hardware. KISS hardware is only manufactured by 
Kiss, or the owner of Kiss now has a new company called Fet Tech, but it's basically the same thing. They don't farm it out. They don't. There, there's no third-party companies making Kiss compatible hardware. Well, there's, there's like one or two exceptions to that, but for the most part, when you buy Kiss hardware, you know you're getting it from the exact same company that makes the software. And I think most people would agree that Kiss is very high-quality electronics. There have been some exceptions. There are some famous stories about certain KISS ESCs lighting on fire. Uh, but for the most part, the quality of KISS hardware is much, much higher than uh, than other stuff. It's like the high-end Betaflight without any of the cheap low-end. And that's especially true for the newer FETTEC gear. The flip side of that is that KISS hardware is so freaking expensive. It's like the most expensive Betaflight gear, and there just isn't an inexpensive option. So if you decide to go with KISS, you you got to have the budget for it. Another aspect of KISS that can be a little frustrating is that there are limited tools for troubleshooting when things aren't going right. In Betaflight, you can dive into the command line and you could get all of the information you could possibly want. It's practically like a computer operating system. And many people find that overwhelming. And that's why KISS sort of got rid of that and said, just don't worry about that. I guess what you could say is that with KISS, when things work really well, they work really well. But when they don't work really well, sometimes it can be a little bit frustrating. Uh, and that applies to sort of basic troubleshooting, but it also applies to PID tuning. The KISS PID controller is intentionally very simple. There are only a few sort of knobs and dials to turn. But if you have some kind of a problem that isn't easy to solve with those whatever knobs and dials, well, in Betaflight, there's probably 17 more knobs and dials that you could play with to try and figure out what to fix it. But in KISS, if you run up against a wall, you may just kind of be stuck. The next firmware on the list is Flight 1. And specifically, we're going to be talking about the latest variant of Flight 1 called Falco X. Uh, and Falco X really stands out because you can set Falco X up completely in the on-screen display. You do not need a PC at all. They just ship you the flight controller. The flight controller has Falco X on it. You wire it up according to the instructions and then you just put your goggles on and there's the video transmitter and Falco X says in the OSD, hey, let's do this. Let's get you set up. This is a big deal because it makes for the easiest setup of pretty much any flight control software. And that's not just because you don't need a computer to do it, but it's also because Falco X inherited Flight 1's setup wizards. If you ever used a, a simulator, and when you first get the simulator, they say, move your sticks in circles in two seconds now, raise your throttle. Now, you don't have to do any of the manual setup of channel mapping, endpoints, aux modes, all that stuff that you do manually in Betaflight. And yes, in KISS 2, even though it's a little simpler in KISS, it's done automatically in Falco X and Flight 1, and that is pretty freaking cool. But Falco X has a lot more going for it than just easy setup and not needing a computer to set it up. It is, many people argue that it's the best flying of the firmwares, especially racers seem to like it. There are some prominent freestyle pilots who use Falco X, but it really made a splash in the racing scene. And there were some racers saying that Flight 1 or Falco X actually made them faster. There are still many prominent racers who prefer Betaflight because they think they can tune Betaflight to get even better performance out of it. But many people st just leave Flight 1 fal slash Falco X on its defaults and think it's a really, really good flying uh, firmware. Just like with KISS, almost all flight controllers that run Flight 1 are manufactured by Flight 1. Unlike Betaflight, where you can just go buy, you could buy a Maytech or a Lumineer, or just a zillion people who make Betaflight flight controllers, only Flight 1 makes Flight 1 flight controllers. And there's basically like two of them. There's a 30 millimeter one and a 20 millimeter one. That's, there are a few more than that. But it's not like with Betaflight, where you have just this huge plethora of different manufacturers and different price points to choose from. Um, one of the downsides of this is that when it's out of stock, nobody has it. If your favorite Betaflight flight controller is out of stock, you could probably find something else to use if you just want to get in the freaking air. That's not the case with Flight 1. And in fact, there have been some really long dry spells where some people just 
I'm not saying it was a lot of people, but some people just gave up on running Flight 1 because they just couldn't get hardware. Flight 1 tries to get the absolute best flight performance out of the quads, and some people mention that they had more problems with hot motors or excess gyro noise on Flight 1 as opposed to some of the other firmwares. Um, many people, for many people, it flies great, but if you have maybe a gyro, your gyro on your flight controller is just a little bit not quite up to snuff, or if your build is not quite up to snuff, if you're not just a, if you have a sloppy build, you can run into issues with hot motors or pro other gyro noise problems. Next, let's talk about Emu Flight, or is it Emu Flight? I don't know, and I don't care, and I don't care if you correct me in the comments. I'm just going to say it however I want to say it. Emu Flight is a branch off of Beta Flight. Uh, there was some disagreement among certain devs over the best way to do a particular th the filtering without going into huge technical details about what Emu Flight thinks is different than Beta Flight. What people who use Emu Flight like about it are, well, number one, some people say that Beta Flight flies bad, Emu Flight flies good. An advantage of Emu Flight is that it runs on all Beta Flight hardware. So any flight controller, all those many, many different flight controllers at many different price points, they all can run Emu Flight. So if you're a lot of the people who switch to Emu Flight are running Beta Flight, and then there's something about Beta Flight they don't like. Mostly it doesn't fly how they can't get it to fly how they want to. And so they switched to Emu Flight, and then sometimes it flies better, and they're like, yay, Emu Flight's great, it solved my problems. Other people have said that Emu Flight has a unique and desirable stick feel, maybe more similar to what you get with KISS or Flight 1, although the people who love KISS and Flight 1 will now be cringing that I said that. Emu Flight has a very devoted developer community, although not many developers work here. It's very small, but very devoted and very connected with their user base. One of the things people said they like about Emu Flight was that it is a small, friendly community. A lot of times, if you have an idea for something you'd like to see done in Beta Flight, it can just feel like shouting into a crowded room and nobody really hears what you have to say. And if they did, they've all got their own ideas for what they're working on. They don't really care anyway. But the Emu developers, it's, they're, 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 it's a much smaller project and they're much more likely to go, oh, that's a great idea. In fact, one thing Emu Flight has done is to bring in some tiny whoop specific features from another firmware that's not in this roundup called Silverware. Silverware is a tiny whoop specific firmware and it, there are certain things about the way tiny whoops fly that are different from the way bigger quads fly. And there were these interesting features that people were like, well, why doesn't, why doesn't Beta Flight do that? And Emu Flight was like, yes, let's do it. So Emu Flight has, in fact, um, Patrick Clark, who is a micro tuner who runs a thing called Project Mockingbird, where they come up with tunes for micro quads. He actually has switched a lot of his tunes over from Beta Flight to Emu Flight because Emu Flight has added these micro specific features. But don't think that Emu Flight is just for micros. A lot of people run Emu Flight on five inches. The beauty of it is that if you feel like you want to try it out, it, you can just flash it, fly it. If you don't like it, go back to Beta Flight. If you're running KISS hardware or Flight 1 hardware, that's not an option. They only run their own firmwares. Downsides of Emu Flight, well, there, there kind of are no downsides because, like I said, you could just go back. To, if you've got Beta Flight hardware, try Emu Flight. You don't like it, go back to Beta Flight. That doesn't really matter. But if there was a downside, I would say that the very small developer base and relatively small test pilot base means develop is focused in relatively limited areas. They're not creating great big new groundbreaking features like, oh, let's add GPS rescue and return to home. They're focused on very small areas and adding small and specific features to adapt the flight experience in specific ways. In addition, they have a much smaller uh, test base. There's just fewer pilots flying it. And so uh, code may not be tested as thoroughly. And it's maybe this is this is not something other people said. This is just my own opinion. Okay, I'm sticking my own opinion in occasionally. It may be more likely for bugs to slip through just because there are fewer developers looking at the code. There's a less structured way of developing the code and there's just fewer test pilots overall. That's a hypothetical, but it wouldn't be the first time that a bug had been introduced by a small developer into a 
flight control software and when when it goes wrong it can go wrong so i feel like it deserves to be mentioned finally let's talk about inav inav is another branch off from betaflight and in fact inav borrows a lot of features from betaflight which is just how open source development works but inav focuses on autonomous flight in other words the ability to do gps sonar barometer uh, optical flow sensor, the ability to make your racing drone fly more like a DJI drone, where instead of having to manually fly every single thing, you can just tell it return to home or you just release the sticks and it stays right where you left it. Betaflight doesn't do that thing. KISS doesn't do that. Flight One, none of the other firmwares do that kind of thing. Well, some of them do just a little bit, but not very well. INAV focuses in that direction. The advantage of INAV is that it runs on the same hardware that runs Betaflight, CleanFlight, and EmuFlight, sort of. Not all Betaflight flight controllers will support INAV because INAV requires like a barometer and maybe it needs a compass or a GPS and not all Betaflight flight controllers can do that. But there's a subset of Betaflight flight controllers that can run INAV and that means you do have a lot of flexibility. If you have an INAV flight controller, you can put Betaflight on it if you decide to change your mind. You can put CleanFlight or EmuFlight on it if you decide to change your mind. That's not an option with KISS and Flight One, which have their hardware locked down. INAV works on a wide variety of different aircraft. If you look at Betaflight, it is very focused on like a five inch freestyle racing drone weighing approximately 550 to 700 grams. And it does work on other, other types of quads, but it's not quite as optimized, especially on larger drones. You put Betaflight on a large, like a 10 inch, uh, a 18 inch prop camera platform, and it's not gonna fly as well without some serious tweaking. INAV has presets for these larger aircraft because it's usually larger aircraft that are doing this kind of autonomous flight. It also supports different kinds of vehicles, like it, it has easy support for fixed wing airplanes. Betaflight can be installed on fixed wing airplanes, but it's a huge hassle to get it working. It often doesn't work as easily or as well as you might hope. With INAV, that's just baked in and it's easy to set up. INAV even supports ground vehicles, like you could put an INAV flight controller on like a car or a truck or a boat. Downsides of INAV, one downside has been that it's pure raw flight performance in terms of acro and racing has not been as good. That, that gap has actually closed a lot in the latest versions of INAV. I'm sure if you are a hardcore racer or just a purist freestyle pilot, you're going to be disappointed in, the, in what INAV's pid loop and INAV's stick feel brings to you. But a lot of people would be perfectly happy flying INAV in acro or freestyle flight. The question would be, why would you? If you could just, I mean, if you really want to fly acro freestyle, just put Betaflight on it. But then you don't have GPS functions, sort of. Betaflight has it, but it's not very good. So that's where INAV comes in. The other thing about INAV is that although it is derived from Betaflight, it doesn't support some of the cutting edge features from Betaflight. Some of that is because INAV has a whole bunch of extra features and there's only so much room on the flight controller to store the code. So INAV has to leave something out in order to fit in all its extra stuff that it does that Betaflight doesn't do. The other reason is that the INAV developers sometimes just have a difference of opinion between them and the Betaflight developers. And they think that what the Betaflight developers are doing isn't actually worth it. They just decide to leave it out. So there are some cutting edge features in Betaflight that are not in INAV. Sometimes that's something you miss, like turtle mode, INAV developers. Why can't I flip my quad over when it's upside down? Beta, everybody, just give me turtle mode, INAV. Like that's just the one that's currently on my mind. Why I can't, oh, oh, anyway. So that brings us to the end of the video. And I hope by now you have a better perspective on which of these is the best. It's not the best overall, cause that's not really a thing. But when you ask people, why is such and such the best? And what don't you like about such and such? These are the things that they say. If you are already into FPV, you've probably settled in on one of these as one you like, but especially for people getting started, it can kind of be overwhelming which of these to pick. It seems like the safest option 
would be to go with a Betaflight, CleanFlight, EmuFlight, iNav compatible board. That hardware can run all four of those firmwares and it means that if you decide you want to try something different, you have the option to switch. It, there's certainly a compelling argument that Flight 1 or Falco X is the easiest to set up. There's no question that it is 100% the easiest of any of them to set up, thanks to its setup wizards. And there's a very good argument that that might be the best one for beginners to pick. You definitely are going to suffer a little bit from lack of tutorials, although the Flight 1 community definitely does its best to, uh, to get that information out there. The one that I think is the hardest to recommend for beginners is KISS. It seems like people usually start somewhere else and then eventually they find their way to KISS and go, oh, what was I missing the whole time? The reason beginners don't start off with KISS, why not? It's supposed to be simple. Well, if you really want simple and easy setup, Flight 1 of Falco X delivers. KISS, you still need to like know some things. It doesn't just literally hold your hand through the whole setup. And KISS is super expensive compared to some of the other hardware that's out there, which steers a lot of beginners away. That being said, if you ever get the chance to fly a KISS quad, they do have, and this is me speaking for myself, agreeing with the, the opinion of many KISS pilots, they do have a certain specialness to the way they fly. They're pretty, they're pretty freaking cool. So why don't I fly KISS all the time? Well, that's another question for another day. Thank you guys so much for watching. And let me know what you think down in the comments. How'd I do? Did I get everything right? Well, I say that. I'm just repeating what you told me. Some of these are my opinion too, but I try to just stay objective and, and collect the data. Anything I left out about one of these, a pro or a con that I overlooked. I mean that you overlooked because you, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Happy flying. Let me know down in the comments. That's what I was trying to say. Let me know in the comments. Fill up those comments. <laughs> Happy flying. What are you still doing here? The video's over. Do you watch all the videos all the way to the end? Wow, you are a super fan. Thank you. That actually helps the channel a lot when you watch the videos all the way to the end. YouTube loves that. You know what else YouTube loves? When you subscribe or when you join my Patreon for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned. Actually, YouTube doesn't like you to join my Patreon. They don't get a cut of that.